All right. Great, you're up for our last session. I don't want you to leave the introductory Adam's session without having at least commented on some real-world applications. We started off with discussing a little bit about artificial intelligence and how it's expected to be a game changer from economical perspective. And we already see AI impacting our daily lives, right? So big things coming. Uh, we also discuss the logistics and um, just to emphasize it, the focus of the course will be on methodology and how the methodology can be applied. So we have the conceptual part of the lecture where we look into methods, algorithms and try to understand how they work and we have the more practical part of the tutorial where we program in Python and try to apply the techniques we learned about. That is the focus. Of course, I will point out relevant applications wherever possible. But as I said, methods will keep us busy quite a bit. It's only fair to acknowledge this focus. So, um, in this session, I want to briefly touch upon certain applications and uh, real-world use cases. And, um, you know, the common denominator when it comes to use cases of, of AI, of, of, of deep learning, in my opinion, has to do with the type of data it allows us to, to process. Let's revisit some basics first. When we talk about data, and my perspective on data is always that I'm interested in data as long as it allows me to support decision making. So I'm looking at data analytics through a management lens. I'm trying to use data to leverage data for gaining insight and creating value from that insight. And when it comes to data, we can distinguish three types. Structured data, semi-structured data, and unstructured data. Structured data is what you well know, what you know well, sorry. Um, tabular data. Think of a, in an Excel table. We have rows that depict observations, maybe customers and marketing. We have columns that characterize the individual observations characterize the customers by features like age or income or type of employment. And in that regard, what makes up a customer is very well structured. Tabular data is the most popular example for structured data and it is really everywhere in business organizations. Excel tables, relational database systems, ERP systems like that of SAP, which keep relational databases under the hood and store everything in these databases. The vast majority of data warehouses also relies on relational database technology and thus provides structured data. And we can also think about time series as structured data um, although a time three might not fit so well into a table, but um, let's not lose ourselves in detail. So that is structured data. And unstructured data is, well, somewhat everything that's, that's not structured, that's not a table. But most um, importantly, textual data and image data, or by extension, video and audio data. That's unstructured data. If you think about a piece of text, a review, a paper, an email, there is no clear defined structure in that text. In an email, what the person sending you these email is, is, is telling you 
and how he or she is composing that email, that can go completely wild. There's no structure whatsoever. In a scientific paper, well, th there would be some structure in the, in the text. There better be an introduction. Uh, maybe there's also an abstract preceding the introduction. Supposedly, there will be some review of, of related work. But, you know, what is in these sections? That varies a lot from one paper to the another, obviously. So again, there is no clear structure that would describe what is in a scientific paper or, or how the text in a scientific paper is organized. And that's generally the case with text, right? Same with video, same with audio. We don't really know what to get. And you can imagine that this creates unique challenges for methods that are to analyze this unstructured data. Lastly, there is semi-structured data. Um, well, predominantly, I would think about formats like XML or JSON, which are used a lot in internet communication to exchange data. Um, obviously, there are somewhere in between structured and unstructured data. Um, Roughly speaking, these formats put a little bit of structure in the data. Um, consider, for example, the case of a purchase invoice. That's textual data. It's clearly not structured. Every invoice has certain elements. It has a recipient with address. It has a sender with, with address, it has billing information, it has detailed information about the items that are invoiced, it probably has information about payment methods, but how exactly this information is catered, that's not defined and varies from one invoice to the other. An XML format or a JSON format could basically take this invoice and structure it a little bit, saying, um, for example, it could depict something, sorry, I'm missing my pen, where's my pen? Um, it could structure an invoice by, by saying, so, first of all, um, here is some data, textual data, describing the sender, uh, where we have a, a name, and you see me writing these, these tags. And the tags are what put the structure into the text. The name might be, um, might be me. I like sending invoices a lot. Um, normally, unfortunately, I'm on the other hand, and rather be the recipient of such invoices. So maybe name, Stefan Nesman. And um, then at some point, the name would be done. So the, the actual data that makes up the name, Stefan Nesman, it's done whenever this tag with a slash comes in the text. And the next piece of information that might be relevant about the sender could be where the sender is, is located or, or where it's affiliated. Um, so maybe, let's say, there is a piece of text describing the organization I'm affiliated with. Oh, actually, it would be a really good idea to use colors here. And the organization could be um, HU Berlin. And it goes on like that. Um, so we would certainly need more items. 
maybe we need an item giving uh, email information and so forth. And certainly we would need an item that does not describe the sender, but um, maybe describe the items of the invoice. You see where this is getting. In general, we do have structure, or at least some structure. And we have data, right? That's the idea. Um, but the specific form of the structure, for example, what pieces of information make up the address of the sender or make up this entity sender, that's maybe not defined and may vary from one invoice to another and in that regard is somewhat semi-structured. Alright, so these pieces of data exist. Um, let's move on. Here I put uh, some classical applications of machine learning that involve, predominantly involve, structured data. We have credit scoring one of my most beloved applications, the practice of using learning algorithms in order to judge the ability of borrowers to repay credit. It's a task that every financial institution is involved with and it does use machine learning quite extensively. And similarly, we have many applications of machine learning in, um, in e-commerce or more generally in marketing where their task is to score customers and estimate behavioral patterns of customers. How likely a customer is to react toward a marketing message, for example. Or we have predictive maintenance where we collect data from sensors of some machinery in manufacturing or in energy. And we use this sensor data in order to judge whether our system is functioning properly. And we aim at detecting trends in the sensor data that would indicate that machinery is about to break. And knowing that would allow us to act, to proactively maintain this piece of machinery, replace something, and by acting proactively, or by doing something proactively, we would probably can save some cost. Um, well, financial forecasting, I guess that does not need any explanation. We have a couple of applications in the scope of fraud detection, anti-money laundering, for example, where we could look at accounting data and strive to detect spurious patterns in accounting records that might be indicative of fraud. These are the types of applications that are very popular and many of these we also have looked at in business analytics and data science. And the thing with deep learning is that, or the, the role of deep learning in these classical applications, I mean, obviously they will not go away just because nowadays we have deep learning and the, the possible, you know, promise of deep learning here could be to improve any of these applications by allowing bringing in unstructured data. That's probably the most important aspect. In a nutshell, whenever you can use a machine learning algorithm, for example, to build up a credit score, you could equally use a deep learning algorithm. From a purely technical perspective, deep learning can do everything that classical machine learning can do. Remember, 
it's a subfield after all. Uh, the question is, when is it worth to think about some complicated, uh, often more costly deep learning type of technology? What is the marginal utility that you could get? And in my opinion, that really is when there is potential to improve any of these applications by using auxiliary data, unstructured data in particular. Um, in financial forecasting, for example, if we want to anticipate stock developments, of course, we can look at past prices. Maybe we can perform some transformations using chart analysis, develop some fancy technical indicators to describe the behavior of a stock price and then hope to forecast it by looking at past behavior that we can do. Also, or in addition, we could consider bringing in data from financial news or Twitter data, hoping that this additional data will rise, will raise our forecasting performance. Same with, with, with any other type of these applications. If you think about e-commerce analytics uh, and you think about a use case where the owner of a web shop wants to predict whether somebody just visiting a product at her shop being likely to buy that product, you can look at browsing behavior, which is pretty much structured data, but you could also uh, bring in signals from unstructured data, reviews of that product to indicate, for instance, What's the perception of this product in consumers' minds right right now? Um, so unstructured data in the form of text could help. What's done in credit scoring these days, or well, at least there are a bunch of papers that try to use non-standard data from, for example, um, email correspondence, smartphone usage, use of social media in order to better predict the readiness of a loan applicant for, for credit and her likelihood to repay that credit. Um, that sounds a bit spurious, I, I know. Uh, still, the idea of it, well, the idea often is that these additional data sources might come in handy in economies where there is a little credit history. Let me show you one example um, in a bit more detail. That is a nice application. Um, you can check up the website if you wish, farmdrive.co.ke. Uh, it's related to credit scoring, credit scoring in agriculture. Um, this tool is in use in Africa. And the situation was such that there were a large number of rather small farmers. And there was no such thing such uh, as a, a well-developed credit scoring ecosystem. There were no credit bureaus like Shufa or Experian, which, which we have, uh, for example. So financial institutions were struggling with judging whether any of these small farmers was, would be able to, to repay a debt. And so it was very difficult for farmers to get a loan from, from a bank because they had no credit history. Normally, if you, oh, it's, it's actually not that bad in Germany, but uh, think about the UK or, or the US. M maybe you know that, I don't know how it is in, in, in other economies, but. In the, in the US, if you have a bad credit record or you, you come to the UK um, and have no credit record and you're trying to apply for a loan, for, you are in trouble. That is not easy at all, I tell you. Um, because banks really demand you displaying your credit worthiness by means of a credit score um, in order to demonstrate that you are up for getting a loan. And if you can't, because you are new to the credit bureau, the institution that would provide these credit scores, you can find yourself in trouble. And um, the situation was a bit like that here. 
in, in this use case. And the company, uh, what they developed was a credit scoring system that would allow small farmers to demonstrate their credit worthiness using various sources of data, very different data. Individual level data, behavioral data, describing the applicant, the farmer in this example, also social data from the, the network of the farmer, think about business relationships here, uh, but also agronomic data, well, all sorts of signals that would allow anticipating the, the likelihood of, of a good harvest. Environmental data, same story. Data describing the business climate that also indicate how able the farmer will be to do business in the current climate, what the propensity of that business is, is, is likely to be. Um, satellite data, various sources of data, and that's the key thing in this example. I'm not trying to endorse this company, don't get me wrong here. What I'm trying to say is that out of these heterogeneous silos of different data, using some sort of deep learning methodology that would be able to untap all these data sources, a system was built that allows judging the ability of lenders to repay debt. And um, obviously there are two sides to this. Uh, that's, that's nice for financial institutions who can make more revenues by supplying credit, but it's equally nice from the perspective of the lender who in some cases for the very first time was put into a, a position to actually get some financing and access to financing is clearly crucial. And this showcases, um, that's all I want to say about it, that really showcases the potential of bringing together various sources of data and then what we have to note, for many of these sources of data, especially when they are unstructured, no really powerful methodology was available to use it in the past. Um, or maybe powerful technology did exist, albeit not as powerful as today, but it was too complicated to use it. That's a very notable thing about deep learning as well. Not only do we have some powerful models, the infrastructure to use that models also is very powerful and, and relatively easy to use. I mean, I know that a couple of minutes ago I was elaborating how painful it can be to set up a Python environment. Bear with me. Um, but, you know, in, in comparison to um, how, how difficult it used to be to deploy something like, God knows, a recurrent neural network and um, how easy it is to do the same task today because libraries like Keras, TensorFlow and others are available for use um, that just cannot be compared. So we are more able to use that technology at lower cost. This allows us to pull and untap various sources of, of new data, non-standard data, and that can facilitate some very interesting applications such as this one. One more of these. Um, I guess you are not so familiar with farming, nor am I, uh, but I'm sure you are familiar with shopping. Um, well, especially these days, many of us do a lot of online shopping, I would imagine. Certainly I did. Um, Let's take this example from the fashion industry. It's an example from a, a real life system that's been deployed at Zalando. Um, imagine um, you browse the web shop, you're interested in buying um, some light clothes for the summer, maybe a nice dress like this one. And uh, you're about to buy it, but unfortunately, unfortunate for, for you, but uh, even more so for Zalando, because they're about to lose some revenue since ah, that item is out of stock. Out of stock in e-commerce, that's not good news. 
most likely people will just leave or you know go, go elsewhere and get the item they're looking for elsewhere um, because delivery times play a key role if you move your mouse to the buy button and then you see an acknowledgement delivery by pff, sometime in two months you're not gonna buy that product be honest um, so what would be useful from the perspective of the shop owner is to recommend some alternative products. So learning that this beautiful dress is out of stock and knowing that the customer is not going to buy it, um, would she know that um, the delivery time will be something like two months? You might be able to recommend alternative products. Bear with me, I'm very ignorant when it comes to fashion, um, as you can see in the video. Hello. Um, let's assume um, we can consider these dresses as somewhat equivalent. Um, let's say these products, these dresses could substitute the one shown on the left. Um, if you strongly disagree, be with me. Again, uh, not a fashion expert. Um, what's, the, what's the idea here? So, um, okay, item is out of stock. We recommend the customer some alternative items that knowing that somebody liked the left dress, this person would also like one of the other dresses, or at least one of them, hopefully buying that one, where I assume that all the recommended dresses here would be available in the warehouse. I mean, of course you can build such a system. That's, it's not too difficult maybe, uh, but what would it actually entail? It's a good exercise to think about that. Building a machine learning system to do this recommendation we would need a way to encode the information of, of similarity. How would an algorithm know that sorry, just playing with my pen again. Um, how would an algorithm know that these two dresses here Are similar. Again, we would need to engineer some features that capture similarity. Maybe it's a cut, color is a no-brainer, um, obviously both dresses are meant for the summer. Yeah, but, but coming up with good features is, is difficult. So it would be nice if an algorithm were able to just analyze the images. Because even me, as a fashion um, non-expert, let's say, is able to say, okay, yeah, these two dresses, clearly they are similar, and, and, and these, yeah, okay, they are very similar. Um, well, here, not too sure these two are similar. The other one looks a bit less summer-like. Um, or not sure somebody who's into blue apparently is also into green here i wouldn't be too sure but um maybe we can extract some patterns that capture the similarity of items of dresses using some image processing algorithm and that is exactly what Salander was doing they um, built a convolutional neural network in order to identify similar images or similar items, dresses, and then build a recommendation system out of that image processing algorithm in order to fight stock outs, in order to you know, market alternative goods whenever customers displayed interest on the website in the shop in buying a good that was currently not on stock. 
And again, what we see here, as in the previous example, it is the mixture of applications that have been around for a while and putting these one step further by bringing in new non-standard data. In this example, image data. And deep learning is the tool that allows us to make use of this novel non-standard data in a nutshell. Yeah, and that is it. That was our very first session. Let's sum up. I wanted to let you know what to expect from this course and why deep learning is something worth studying. I hope we achieve this goal. Uh, we learn about the agenda and the logistics, especially those in the summer semester. And um, well, concerning the actual content, our take home is that heterogeneous non-standard type of data might have value for businesses. This is why we need deep learning. This is how advanced data analytics or deep learning can support decision-making in business organizations. Uh, some homework maybe. Um, we will in the next session briefly revisit linear models and supervised machine learning models. So revisiting linear models, if you feel a bit shaky here, that would be a good idea to ready for the next session. Um, Importantly, please make up your mind about infrastructure. Would you like CoLab? Try it out. Or some other tool. Amazon has a great tool, SageMaker, uh, for example. Um, if you know that or are keen to explore it, that might be an alternative to Google CoLab. Um, do you rather use your own machine than read the blog that I was recommending earlier on, uh, go through the slides I make available on Moodle and set up your machine. And finally, I put in potentially interesting read on Moodle, which is a report on careers in AI. Um, well, don't, don't, don't take that too serious. It's clearly not a homework. I just thought you might be interested uh, to learn a little bit about um, career opportunities and further emphasize why it's actually useful to learn about deep learning and AI. All right, that was it for today. Thank you very much for watching the videos. And in our next session, we'll look into supervised machine learning and start with familiarizing ourselves with neural networks. Till then, um, wish you all the best and thank you very much for your attention.